Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Christina. I'm a naturopath, herbalist and life coach. And today I'm going to be talking about silica and silica deficiency. So this topic came up in one of my carnival support groups where people were asking, how do we naturally help to bring up our silica um, deficiencies that we actually have? How do we rebuild silica in our bodies? And I thought, what a great conversation for um, over on the channel. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, silica is a mineral. We need it in trace amounts in order to be able to do some of the things that our body needs to actually do. Uh, so, for example, one of those places where it's really important is our bone and teeth. So if you are somebody that has a lot of um, bone issues, so for example, you might have osteoporosis or you might just know that your bone density is down. Yes, that's one of my doggos. Um, your bone density might be down or you have a lot of cavities. So you may have lost teeth or have your teeth breaking down. Um, silica can be one of the minerals that you're actually lacking in. There may of course be others as well because we need our minerals in a really good balance so that balance is super important in order for the body to do what it actually needs to do so bone health is one of those those indications uh, it's one of the areas that we actually need silica the other one which is a big one for a lot of women is our hair and our nails so if our hair is thinning for example it can often be a sign that we don't have enough silica our nails this for me as a naturopath is the number one place where i'm going to look for silica deficiencies and one of the things that i generally do is because uh, i work online is i get my clients to send me a photo of their nails their tongue and their eyes so that i can look at any of the mineral deficiencies that they may actually be having and so when i'm looking at the nails when i'm looking at a silica deficiency i'm looking for vertical ridges so ridges that come from this end to this end and you know how thick and how easy are they to see how prominent are they that is one of those signs for me that there's a cilia, silica deficiency if those ridges are thick really easy to see are really prominent um, that means that there's even more of a silica deficiency now also you might notice that your nails are, are thin um, or crack easily you might notice that your hair is thin and you get lots of little um, split ends relatively easily and that your hair is thinning those are some of the signs that you've got a silica deficiency. Your skin is also another sign. So if you've got dull skin, um, that can be a sign that you've got a silica um, deficiency. And so we're kind of looking at all of these different things when we're actually trying to work out what deficiencies your body actually has. Um, so silica is also super important for joints and joint flexibility. Uh, and so if you are struggling with things like arthritis, for example, um, if you've got a thickening of your joints, that can be a sign that you don't have enough silica. Uh, and so I'm likely to actually maybe write you a script for um, a silica supplement or tell you some foods that I want you to predominantly start to eat. Now, detoxification is another big part of the body that silica is prominent in. Uh, and it is used for, in particular, very good at binding with toxins as well as heavy metals and so when it's a, when we're talking about a binder a binder essentially inactivates the things like the toxins or the heavy metals and prevents them from from um, actually doing more damage and, and drives getting them out of the actual body uh, and so silica is really useful in that process of detoxification so if you are somebody that's got a lot of detoxification issues then silica might be a nutrient that you would be recommended um, digestive health. So silica is also important for the lining of the actual gut um, and to help you with a good, you know, absorption rate of other foods. So if your lining of your gut is out of balance or, or not um, as healthy as it could be, you're not going to be able to absorb your food. So you're going to end up with more nutrient deficiencies. And um, that can, of course, play into a whole bunch of different other things that other illnesses that you might then develop because you've got deficiencies. Uh, so silica is important in actually rebuilding and regenerating and maintaining the health of the gut lining. So for me, when it comes to silica in clinic, it is sometimes something that I will supplement and it's sometimes something that I won't, depending on what is actually happening with those other organ systems. So the more signs and symptoms that silica is out of balance for you, the more we're likely to actually encourage you to actually increase silica-rich foods 
uh, and or take a silica type of supplement. So for me, when it comes to recommending those things to my clients, there are, I, I am predominantly an animal-based individual myself, um, but depending on the dietary um, sort of processes of that individual, depend on what I might recommend. But from an animal-based perspective, bone broth is one of the, the best sources of silica. Uh, especially if you've taken those bones, you've added a little bit of acid to it. What you do is you mobilize, so that acid could be apple cider vinegar or lemon juice and water, kombucha, for example. Um, what you've done is you've mobilized the minerals. So you release them from the bone and actually allow them to be in the actual fluid itself. And so bone broth is a really great tool to actually increase silica. Um, another way to increase silica is to use eggshells. Now, eggshells is something that I'm going to often use for people who have got osteoporosis, for example, in particular, because uh, it not only has silica, it also is going to have calcium bicarbonate in it as well, which is uh, critical for actually bone development. Uh, and so generally what I'll get people to do is to wash out their eggs really well, dry them in a warm oven so that any of the mucous membranes are all dried out um, and the bacteria might like uh, has been killed so it's not thriving and that the eggshell itself is bone dry and at that point we can put it into a grinder of some type so you might use a mortar and pestle you might use a coffee grinder you might use a food processor in order to turn it into kind of like a powdered form and then once you've got it in that powdered form you can add it to other things that you're going to drink or consume to actually bring that nutrient in. Now, another one is seafood, but in particular, um, it's going to be like the exoskeleton of some of your seafood. So for example, shrimp, the, the shell, crabs in the shell, that's where silica is going to be found. So for me, when I'm encouraging people to use seafood as a part of their silica rebuilding tools, I want them to do it from the perspective of a broth. So making like a seafood broth, for example. So let's say you've got got prawns or um, crab or crayfish or any of those types of hard shelled animals where you're going to remove the shell and you might use that for another thing put those into some water with a little bit of acid uh, and then boil them so that you're extrapolating the silica as well as the other nutrients and flavors from that actual shell as well um, so that's that's one way to bring it in and then organ meats so your animal organ meats are going to be higher in silica as well because uh, all of your connective tissue is high in silica um, it's a precursor as well for creating um, collagen and so from that perspective anything that's going to have some collagen in it is going to have some silica so that's like your ligament so if you roast a lamb for example and you've got the joint of the lamb all of the joint or all around where you've got those ligaments is going to be high in silica as well as um, collagen and other um, beneficial beneficial nutrients there for you so consuming those it's actually good for you now one thing that i do for my family is that sometimes they're a little bit picky and those little ligaments can be a little bit chewy and they don't necessarily want to chew on them. So what I might do with some of my dishes is actually take the skin. So for example, let's say I'm cooking chicken breast in some other type of recipe. I'm going to take the skin from that chicken breast and any of the little ligaments that I can get from the chicken as well as from things like lamb, etc. Wherever there's a joint bone, you're going to find some and actually blend that into a paste. Um, and once I've blended that into a paste, I can add that to any food that I've got. No one's going to be any the wiser. It's going to taste really nice and it's going to have some of that silica and collagen in it. Um, so that is another way. Now, the other way that I generally get clients from a food-based way to get silica in is through colloidal minerals. Now, colloidal minerals is something that I generally recommend a lot of my clients to take because our water is often deficient in those minerals because we're either... Um, using tap water that may have been cleaned and filtered and then had other chemicals added to it or we might actually have our own filtration system at home like reverse osmosis now reverse osmosis is good at taking everything out which means that that mineral that water is now devoid of minerals as well and so from that perspective we want to add back some of the things that we're actually lacking because water is naturally meant to have minerals within it 
And so adding a colloidal mineral to that can be really beneficial. Now, there are some really great ones on the market. There are a couple in particular that I have researched to the point where I'm like super happy to share the brand names. Um, but that doesn't mean that other ones aren't as, a, as beneficial or as effective. It just means that I haven't researched them. Uh, so Changing Habits, for example, have a really good one in their mineral range. Um, King Island Kelp have a really good one as well. Theirs comes from the kelp around the King Island. Uh, and then the last one that I really like is Modea. Um, and all of those are plant-based ones, so they basically have juiced the plant in some way, shape or form to extrapolate those minerals and put it into that, that liquid for you. You just add some of that liquid to your actual water and that's going to help to remineralize those particular ones. Now, some salts are going to have some silica in it as well. Uh, Celtic sea salt, for example, in particular, tends to be a really good one. Himalayan salt can also have a really good source of silica as well. Now, when it comes to absorbing these nutrients, we've got to remember that there's often cofactors and or things that stop us from absorbing them super well. So for example, when it comes to silica, high levels of excess calcium can be um, a deterrent for the absorption of silica. So one of the ways that you would note that you have this is bone spurs, for example. That's where you've got an imbalance of minerals, so you've got more um, of a particular type of calcium, um, but not enough to make a complete bone, and that's where you're going to get a bone spur actually happening. Uh, so that's going to be an indication that A, you're deficient in silica, and B, it's going to decrease your absorption of silica. So you might need to over, um, over consume for a little bit until that's actually balanced out. Now, other things to think about when it comes to absorption of silica and any nutrient in particular, of course, is gut health. If your gut is not functioning, so for example, you have leaky gut or gut permeability. If you have um, a really out of balance microbiome when it comes to your gut, um, these are going to be some of the things that will make it a little bit more challenging for you to absorb nutrients and any nutrient, not just silica. Uh, and again, that might be that you need to overexpose your body to those nutrients to begin with. As your body repairs, then it will actually be able to absorb it and you'll need less of them. Um, vitamin D is important for the absorption of silica. So for me, you know, things like butter are a really good source. Um, sardines are a really good source. Uh, pork that has, so pigs, for example, that have been able to free range in the sun are going to have higher levels of vitamin D in their fat. Um, some of your good quality seafoods are going to have some great vitamin D levels, especially cod liver oil is another good source of um, vitamin D as well so naturally that you can get from animals. Um, magnesium is important for absorption of silica as well. So having some of these things in conjunction um, with your silica is really helpful. Uh, and just remember that 50% of the silica you can consume is likely to not be absorbed. It's not a highly absorbent nutrient. So you sometimes need to expose your body to a bit more in order to be able to fill up that deficiency. Now, if I've got somebody in clinic who is um, particularly deficient in silica, then uh, on top of recommending some of these eating things to actually consume, I might actually supplement them for a period of time. It's generally around 12 to six, 12 weeks to six months or three months to six months is generally however long I'm actually going to be supplementing. Now I might do that in a liquid form, um, but predominantly I'm actually going to use a celloid to actually do that because um, they're a smaller mineral size, which means that they're much more absorbable in the actual body. Um, so that's generally what I'm gonna do in clinic. Um, but of course, with any of this type of information, always check with a practitioner to see if you actually need silica uh, and if it's one of those things that you're deficient in. But one of my favorite ways to approach these types of things is to look at it a food-based way. So for example, if you started to increase or add bone broth into your diet on a daily basis with a little bit of Celtic sea salt or a little bit of Himalayan salt, the likelihood is that you're just going to be exposing your body to that nutrient as well as a whole heap of others. And if your body needs it, it will absorb it. If it doesn't, it'll let it go and you'll just release it via urine or poo. Um, and so for me, that's, that's generally the safest, most effective approach when you're not completely sure that you actually have a deficiency. Um, but that's something to think about. So just one other slight thing that I want to add in here is that for myself, when it came to hair, 
I noticed that my hair was thinning before carnivore. Once I came on carnivore, I did, did do a, a drop at the start, um, but then once I really consciously increased my fat and my exposure to vitamin D, uh, my hair actually started to grow back, started to grow thicker, uh, and of course grows a lot faster than it previously did. Um, so that's something to think about as well. All right, if you've enjoyed this, remember to like and subscribe. If you do have anything, any, any particular things you'd like me to focus on, let me know below and I will endeavor to actually embark on uh, looking at that. Otherwise, have the most amazing day ever and I will talk to you again soon. Bye for now. See you later. P.S. The links are in the comments for th or in, the, in the show notes for things like booking an appointment and joining my carnivore support group. Bye for now. See ya.